what a morning. I've got a sermon that I'm excited about delivering. I'm going to jump into it. I believe it's from the, the Lord. I know it's from the Lord because everything in hell has tried to stop this thing. Hey. <laughs> Listen. Pastor Steve said we had some issues. Like, I mean, you know, anytime you have an event, you had you just whatever. And, and it was a lot. And he's like, Pastor Steve, earlier this week, said, listen, man, if you need me to preach, I know you got that event Saturday. If you need me to preach, man, I, you know, it's good. I, I'll, I, you know, I'll, I'll do it and we get you on another time, whatever. And I said, no, man, I got it. And we come in this morning. We come in this morning, right? Every, you know, come in this morning and. We make our we we come in. I don't know if you know this. We come in about 8:15, 8:30. We rehearsal. We put the set together. We put the set together, and everybody goes about their business. And then I get a phone call. I love those phone calls and texts on Sunday mornings. I get a phone call, and it's my sister, uh, Julie, and she says, "Brother, how, how did you, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm like, Liz, sis." I got a lot going on. Just spit it out. I can't come back. I got to. But well, anyway, she had something happen, and she had to run to Indianapolis to pick up her son. He forgot something. I don't know his keys in, in New York or Salina or somewhere, and he had to go. She had to go get Jake. So guess what that did? Guess what that did to our set list? I'm just giving you a little inside if, in case seems things, in case seems things seem a little awkward this morning so guess what that did it didn't change who God is it didn't change the fact he deserves my glory and honor it just kind of made the water swirl around me it just made the waters get a little rough but I know the peace speaker it didn't change the fact that's who he is and that's who will be tomorrow and the next day and the next day after Anyway, I'm going to preach now. My wife told me, she's not here, Annie's not well, so keep Annie in your prayers. She said, be short, they can't handle your long messages. I said, well, I'll do my best. So I'm going to do my best to be short. I got one point, and my point is this. Payday's coming. There it is. It's up there. I said, payday's coming. There's a payday coming. That's a good spot to clap. It really is. I, I, uh, some of you may not know what kind of payday is coming, but let me just remind you, there's a payday coming. Did anybody get a payday candy bar in the house this morning? I don't know what you did with your payday. I think some of you probably ate your payday already. If you did do that, please don't leave your wrapper on the church floor or in the seat back in front of you. Please just put that in your pocket or in your purse. If you ate your payday, I'm just curious. I want you to confess right now. Say, I ate my payday. Oh, my goodness. Hey, either, either, did I see one hand go up? It's okay. Sometimes I eat my payday, too. Like, literally. Whoa. Rudy's down there holding up three, four paydays. Rudy, one payday. Amen. Payday's coming. Listen. If you work a job, or even if you're on a fixed income, you have a payday. Some get paid by the week, some get paid bi-weekly, and some get paid by the month. But there's one thing for sure, if you got it coming, if you got it coming, payday is going to happen, it's coming. How many people in this room are like me? You look forward to payday. I used to look more forward to payday than I do right now because everything's electronic now. Like, I don't even see my check. I don't even see, like, the little emails that says what I got paid. It just goes in my account, right? Hallelujah. Hang on, hang on. It's all right. Somebody help Aaron. Come on. Aaron's having a seizure. Somebody just help Aaron. That's all right. Don't everybody move at once. Come on. Somebody help Aaron. Call it. It's all right. He's all right. Come on, Lord. We just asked you that you would help Aaron this morning. 
I rebuke the seizures in Jesus' name. I rebuke the cause of that in Jesus' name. I declare the blood of Jesus. No weapon formed against him shall prosper. We bless your name. I'm going to stop right now. I'm going to address a, another elephant in the room. I told Dylan, listen, it had nothing to do with Aaron. I, I told Dylan before church started, I said, there is a spirit trying to stop this word from going forth this morning. I said, if it's went wrong, it could go wrong this morning. And when I said this, I meant nothing ill of Aaron, but I'm just going to, I, I prophesied this this morning to my son. I said, there's going to be disruption in the house this morning. I prophesied that. Did I not say that to you this morning? I'm going to stop right now and I'm going to ask you to agree with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I bind every spirit that would come against your word from going forth. I claim victory in this house this morning. Lord, I ask that you open up every ear. I pray that you would open up every heart in this house this morning. That your word could go forth and fall on good ground and bring forth a mighty harvest. I stand on your promise in Jesus' name and let the church say, Amen. There's a payday coming. There's a payday coming. When I, uh, I used to look so forward, not as much to it anymore as the payday because I would get my check. It would be a paper check. How many remembers paper checks? You still may get them, but I ain't seen one in years. But I would get that paper check and I would sign the back of it. And as a young man, I was out of school, I would sign that check and I would take it down to Big Bear. Y'all remember, I don't know if y'all remember Big Bear. I would take that check down to Big Bear and I would cash that check at the Big Bear. Because the first thing I had to do with that check on Friday was buy Miss Mandy a dozen roses. Every Friday. Now, don't clap your hands. I don't do it anymore. You should say boo. You should still do that. But I don't do it because I don't get a paper check. And I would take that and I would buy her those. And then I would go across the street to the bank and put the rest of it in the bank. And she just lived right there close to Big Bear. And I would walk down there and I would give her her flowers. And we would go to the movie show or the drive-in depending on the, the season. But I, we look forward to payday. I'm going to tell you a little story. When I was a kid growing up, I lived in Muncie, Indiana. We lived in an old house on 12th Street. I don't know if anybody, anybody familiar with 12th Street in Muncie, Indiana, a few, a few of you. It's a big, busy, busy street. It's four lanes of traffic. We lived on old 12th Street in this old house. And it wasn't long after we moved in that house, the roof on that house went bad. It did. It went bad, but we probably knew that going in. It was, we was, things were a little cheaper then. Dad probably gave 10000 for that house or something. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't much. It wasn't much, but it was our house. And so Dad called all the men in the church, and all the men in the church came over, and they put a new roof on that house. But it already had several layers of shingles on the roof. So you, what that means is you had to strip it all the way down to the wood. And what that mean, meant for me was a little bit of a payday because all, everything they stripped off that roof, there was roofing nails going everywhere. Roofing nails going everywhere. And Daddy said this. He said, son, if I need you to go out there, and your job, your job is this, to go out there because magnets don't pick up. Sometimes you can just run magnets over to pick up screws, but roofing nails aren't like that. They're galvanized. Magnets won't pick them up. He says, son, I need you to go out there and pick up every one of them roofing nails. And I will give you a penny for every roofing nail you pick up. All right, let's roll. I said, how about two pennies? He said, no, how about one penny? I said, all right, here we go. Let's go. Penny time. I went out there and I had me a bag. Uh, I had to search for some of these. I guess they still got these around. I had a bag just like this. 
I had me a bag, an old brown bag, just like this. Anybody ever remember these old brown bags before? Didn't used to have the plastic ones. I had me an old brown bag. And uh, I filled that thing about halfway up with roofing nails. He said, I want you to count them roofing nails because I don't want you cheating me. I said, okay, Daddy, I'll count them roofing nails. And I, I remember this. He had me write that down in a, like the old spiral notebook. He had me write it down and keep track of how many nails I had. If I remember right, I had like a 1,000 nails picked up in this bag. Well, how much does that equate to? Ten bucks. Well, in 1986, ten bucks was a lot of money. Especially for a little boy about ten years old, ten bucks was a lot of money. I could buy me a lot of gas to go in my little tractor or mini bike for 10 bucks. You see, I'm saying I could buy me some fishing baits with 10 bucks. Well, I got a little greedy. I had picked up all the nails I wanted to pick up. I had pulled nails out of shingles. I'd picked them up out of rocks. We had a little bit like rock around the house, and it was, they was down in there, and my fingers hurt, and they got poked. I was sick of picking up nails, but I wanted some more money. Do you hear me? How many knows double time's way better (laughs) than straight time? Come on. Raise your hand if you like double time better than straight time. Maybe not tax-wise, but if it's tax-free, hey, bring it on. So what I did is I give Dad this bag. All right? I gave him that bag, and then he gave me a bag. Not really. He didn't really give me a bag, but he gave me a payday. You see that? He gave me a payday. So I said, man, that was easy. Now, I didn't think my dad was this dumb to get tricked. I didn't think he was dumb enough to get tricked by a 10-year-old. I had this great idea. I said, I'm going to go get another bag. I'm going to get me a different bag. It looks a little different. And I'm going to take the nails, the payday out of that bag, and I'm going to put it in this bag, and I'm going to go show my daddy. That's pretty smart for a 10-year-old, ain't it? I said, Daddy, I got another 1,000 nails, baby. He gave me a 20 spot. I got double time. Look at your neighbor and say, double time. I was so excited to get my payday. I was so excited to get my payday. I couldn't believe he fell for it more than anything else. That was amazing. Because he's not stupid. He's not, but he fell for it. And he knew I was a liar. <laughs> when I was a kid, I couldn't tell the truth. That's why, I mean, I tell the truth a lot. A lot all, all 99 points into the, yeah. I tell the truth now that I'm an adult. But when I was a kid, could I tell the truth? Say it out loud. No. <laughs> no. It was a problem. It was a problem. But upon payment, I got a little nervous. I got a little nervous. My story's almost, I got a sermon about this long, but I got to tell this story to get here. Can you handle a little bit more of my story? I got a little nervous about payday. Because when I was a kid... You got to remember, I, and I don't say this boastfully, but I'm proud of my heritage. I'm a fourth generation minister of the gospel. And, no, that, and that has nothing to do with me. That has something to do with four generations ago and a foundation that was laid. So in ministers' homes, most people, when they play games with their children, they play stuff like catch, maybe sit down and play checkers, maybe play go fish, maybe play a board game. But in a minister's home, the games you play are a little different, evidently, because we used to play a game, and it was called Rapture Drill. A Rapture Drill. My dad's covering his face, and it's red because he knows I'm not lying. We would have Rapture Drills in our house. Now, I want to make sure everybody understands this, so I'm going to stop right here a minute, because if you don't know, I want to explain it. How many in here knows what the Rapture is? Raise your hand. Okay, that, I've seen about every hand go up. We would have rapture drills. So as I received double payment, 
for the nail job, as I like to call it. My heart skipped a beat, and a little bit of an anxiety attack came on because I thought about the rapture game. Now, how do you play the rapture game? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me explain it to you. I want to explain to you how you play the rapture game. Well, it starts out like this. You set your kid down and you say this. You say things like this. Now listen, honey, there's a real hell and there's a real heaven. And heaven or hell could come for you at any time. You're telling this to your eight-year-old. You could die at any second, son. Or the rapture could happen at any second. Now remember, I'm eight years old. I'm not sure how much sin besides lying I could do, but (laughs) evidently the lying was a real problem or we wouldn't have played this game. (laughs) He says, son, one day Jesus is going to come back and he's going to be riding, and this is the conversation, he's going to be riding a big white horse and he's going to split the eastern sky and come back with heaven's army. And if you keep telling him the lies, boy, you ain't going with him. <laughs> Son, if you would happen to die in your sleep, I'm eight. <laughs> I think I was eight the first time we played this game. <laughs> Son, if you happen to die in your sleep, you'll split hell wide open. All right. That's how you start playing the game. You tell your kid. <laughs> it's only in ministers' houses, okay? I mean, real, uh, real families don't do this. <laughs> and I've ne- hey, just to be clear, I've never played this game with my kids. I promise. I've never, never, never. <laughs> okay. You're going to go to hell, boy. I know you're just seven, but look at that sin in your life. <laughs> All right. So that's how the game starts. All right, so this game's not like a regular game. This game can last for days. It can last for weeks, right? You just stop it right there with that conversation. It stops it. Hey, son, do you want to go play catch? Yeah, Dad. Go out and play catch. Maybe you actually do play a game of checkers. But then about three days later, hey, son, you remember that talk we had the other day? And as soon as he says it, your heart just starts. That's probably why I had to have heart surgery at 20, 26. <laughs> he said, son, you remember that conversation? Well, huh? You know, about the big guy coming. Oh. <laughs> yep. He just come back. And so the game just plays out. But then when your kid acts up, and I forget about that talk, or I tell a lie, or I act ugly, that's when the game ends. That's when the ending of the game happens. That's when, when your kid acts ugly, that's when you go to your bedroom. The parent goes to their bedroom or in a closet or hides in the shower. All right. All right. And they they shut the door behind them. I preached a sermon called Shut the Door Behind You. It was a good one. You should go back and listen to it. They shut the door behind them. And they get down in there, and then this happens. Jesus, is that you? <laughs> Look, Trish, it's my grandma. Grandma, it's so great to see you. <laughs> Goodbye, world. Goodbye, Chad. <sighs> Goodbye, life of sin. Listen, you shout that out, and then you slip underneath the bed. And you just wait for the crying to start. And after the crying gets real bad, after about five minutes, you come out and say, rapture drill. Rapture drill. Payday's coming. As a kid, I didn't understand the mercy and the grace of God. I didn't understand what it was. I suppose that's why I grew up and wrote a song about it. I need your grace. I need your mercy. As a kid, I pictured God. 
I pictured my relationship with God as some sort of strange game of whack-a-mole and he's standing above me with the Bible just waiting for me to mess up and hitting me on top of the head. That was my view as God as a kid. And sometimes I think that's the view of many people in this world. I think that's the view of a relationship with God with many people. Some people view God with a Bible just hitting, hitting us, waiting for us to mess up. And instead, and instead of having an intimate relationship with the creator of everything, we also often have a rule-based interaction with the creator. And we have some, some kind of rule-based interaction confused with the relationship. Yes. That went over a lot of people's heads, but I just want to say that again. Sometimes we get a rule-based interaction confused with the relationship with the creator of the universe when he's longing for a relationship with you. It's easy to look at godly people following rules and working at the church often and come to a conclusion that I must have to be almost perfect almost to have to live a perfect life, and I must have to work a lot down at the church in order to be right with God. I don't want anyone to be confused about this. Right living and doing kingdom work is nothing more than a byproduct of knowing Jesus. Listen, when you try to act right to be right with God, you've got the cart in front of the horse. The fruit of the Spirit, you don't try to have the fruit of the Spirit. That's not something you, listen, this may be controversial, but let me say that. That's not something you strive to have. You strive to have a relationship with Jesus, and the byproduct is love, peace, joy, patience, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, patience, mercy, all that. The good works come forth because you know Jesus. You don't do good works to get to know Jesus. And I feel like we need to take a step back in the church and take a gander at our relationship and saying, do I actually have a worked base relationship with Jesus? I don't want anybody, anyone to be confused about this. This is not something that I'm forced to do. It's something that I do because of who lives in me. Luke 6.45 says this, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of what's in my heart, it is produced in my actions. It is produced in what I do. It's called overflow. For example, if a powerful Sunday Sunday morning worship service experience does not happen for you, It's not because you came to the church house prayed up, read up, and you've spent every day of the week in prayer with Jesus. I know that hurt and I know that made some people mad, but let me go back. I want to say that one more time because I kind of butchered that. If a powerful Sunday morning worship experience doesn't happen for you, it's not because you've spent time with Jesus. What you've been involved in all week is what's going to overflow out of your life even on Sunday morning, every day. I want to read a Proverbs to you, Proverbs 23, 6. Don't eat of the food of the one who is stingy and do not crave his delicacies. As the man calculates the cost to himself, this is what he does. He tells you to eat and drink. But he doesn't really mean it. The King James Version said it like this. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I wonder, as we come in on Sunday morning and we sing and we worship God, if God doesn't look at that and say this, they don't mean it. Because as we're thinking, we're coming in just doing a thing because this is what we do on Sunday morning. But do we mean it? Is it real praise? Is it real honor? Is it real glory that we're 
projecting to him, that we're giving to him, that we're offering to him. I saw, I'm sorry about that rant. I almost forgot we're talking about a payday this morning. Just do me a favor and just get a little churchy with me and look at the person sitting next to you. Do it. Do it right now. Do it right now. Look at the person sitting next to you and say, payday's coming. A great payday is coming. A payday involves a type of currency. Let me say that again. I said a payday involves a type of currency. And since what we will, we will walk on in heaven is what we try to earn here, I doubt that the payday in heaven is going to be uh, silver and gold. Uh, I wonder what the currency of heaven is. Money on this earth can literally move a mountain if you have enough of it. Money can build or buy anything you want if you have enough of it. Outside of mental health, physical health, and relational health, if you have enough money, you can fix anything. It's a powerful thing. But it takes a lot of money to do anything significant. But I'm thankful this morning that money isn't the currency of heaven. But instead, I'm thankful that the currency of heaven is faith. The currency of heaven is faith. And I have good news to tell you this morning. Romans, the 12th chapter, the third verse says this, that God has dealt each and every one of you a measure of faith. The currency of heaven has already been instilled with you. And I don't know what you're doing with God, with what God has put into you, but God has put a portion of it inside of you. There may be some people in here wondering, what can I do with faith? What can I do with faith? Before I tell you, let me ask you one question in this house. Do you believe the Bible? If you believe the Bible is the written word of God, I want you to raise your hand. If you don't, that's okay. You're, don't be ashamed. Okay, cool. Do you believe the Bible is for you today? Please raise your hand if that's you. Okay. Very good. Very good. Hebrews tells us what faith is. This scripture was nailed into me as a teenager. Our past, my youth pastor, Tony Shaw, drilled it into me. He said this, and you got to learn this or you're never leaving my class. Now faith is the substance. It's the substance. It's something of things hoped for with the evidence of things not seen. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for with the evidence of things not seen. That's what faith is. Oh, it's a big deal. So what can we do with faith? Matthew 7.20 says this. I tell you with certainty, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. Some of you looking at me weird like those are my words, but they're not my words. That's the words that Jesus said. I didn't say it. The creator said it. I didn't say it. The one who paid the price for my payday said it. He said, you can move mountains with faith. He said, nothing will be impossible to you with faith. It would take a lot of money. I already said that to move a mountain, but you could do it. But it only takes just a little bit of faith. Hey. Hey, just a little bit of the God stuff. Allow me to tell you what Hebrews 11 has to say about faith. This is very familiar, but let me go here. By faith, the elders obtained a good report. By faith, the worlds were framed by the word of God. By faith, Enoch Walked with God and he wasn't because God took him. Oh my God, that God could take me, that nobody even sees me anymore. By faith, Noah built an ark and escaped disaster. It was by faith that Abraham received an inheritance from God. It was by faith that Sarah found strength to conceive a child at a very old age. It was by faith that Moses refused to be called the daughter of this, excuse me, it was by faith that Moses refused to be the, called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I wish some people in the church today would refuse to be called the sons and daughters of the things of this world. It happened by faith. 
By faith, the fire was quenched. By faith, the lion's mouth was shut. It was by faith that the sword of the enemy didn't come your way. It was by faith. It was by faith and faith alone. I'm so thankful that the currency of heaven has already been given to me. And the only thing I have to do to spend it, it's real simple. I simply got to believe in the one that gave it to me. All I got to do is believe in the one who gave it to me. It's not complicated. I don't think that we spend our faith the right way because I don't believe we know Jesus the right way in a lot of cases. I don't believe that we're accessing everything that God has for us and walking in the blessings that he has for us fully because I don't believe we know him in an intimate way. Some of you have been believing for some kind of breakthrough in your life. And I feel this this morning. I want to tell you that payday's coming. Payday's coming. Just keep believing. Keep holding on. Romans 10, 9 says this, that if I will confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and I believe in my heart that God raised Christ from the dead, I will be saved. What a backwards economy. What a backwards economy the kingdom of heaven is. In this world, in this economy, if all you do is talk about something, and if all you do is believe you're going to accomplish something, well, I believe that, well, somebody's just going to, I'm talking about the economy of this world, understand I believe that somebody's just going to give me money to pay my bills so I don't think I'll go to work. That you would have a, if that's, that's, that would, that's a backwards economy. But Jesus said this, I paid the price already. There's nothing you can do to earn it. You can't go to a job. You can't serve me good enough. You can't love me good enough. I paid the price. I already put the currency inside of you. And all you have to do is believe in me and spend it. Just believe in me and spend it. It's already been paid for. There's a generational. Look at your neighbor and say, payday's coming. Payday's coming. It's a generational payday. I'm so glad for my great, great, great grandparents. I'm so glad they put their faith in Jesus. Although my great-great-grandparents have entered into their payday, because of the foundation that they laid for my generation, I'm standing here today. Because of what they laid, my kids are standing here today. It's their payday. It's never too late to lay a foundation for your future. It's never too late to start laying. You say, man, I don't have that kind of heritage. It's never too late to, to, to start your godly heritage today for, for future generations to come. I'm so glad payday's coming. Miss Jessie, are you so glad that payday's coming? Miss Clara, are you so glad that there's a payday coming? All I all they've had to do is put their faith in Jesus. They didn't have to believe. They didn't have to work. They didn't have to work. They didn't have to, they didn't have to pay a fee. But all they had to do was believe in Jesus and their payday's coming. Are you thankful payday's coming? Is the house thankful that payday? Do you believe that there's a payday coming? Do you believe that this morning? I'm thankful that there is a payday coming. And what a glorious payday there is. There's so, I look across this room and I see so many missing. And I see a church gone out of a church that my father often, often mentions of people in this place that's gone and went to heaven. I see Glenn missing. I see Tom missing. And boy, I just think they've entered into their payday. It breaks my heart. Brother Lester's not here with us anymore. Brother Dale's not here anymore. I remember old sister Hammond from the other building and sister Baker. 
Oh, their payday has come. And for one reason and one reason only, they put their faith and hope in a living Savior named Jesus Christ. Dylan, I want you to come help me. There's a payday coming. I'm closing. I want to talk just briefly as I close this thing out about the other payday. Because if heaven has a currency, then I want you to know that hell also has a currency. You cannot believe in heaven and the currency thereof without believing in the other and the currency thereof. If you don't believe me that there's a different kind of payday other than heaven, and you don't believe me that sin has a currency. Well, first of all, the Bible declares it in Romans 6.23. It says this, for the wages. How many earn wages? That's what that payday thing is we get every week. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life Ah. I'm so thankful for the eternal life part but it doesn't change the fact that it says the wages of sin is death if you don't believe me just ask David you know David and Goliath David and the boy that took out a lion, the boy that took out a bear, the boy that was fearless, the boy that was a great musician, so good. He was so anointed of God that when he played his music, evil spirits would flee. Hey, read your Bible. It's in there. He was an anointed man of God. God loved David. David said this, David, you're the you're the apple of my eye. But even though David was talented in ministry, even though he was a fearless shepherd, even though he was a fearless soldier on the battlefield, he was flawed. He had flaws. And just because God loved his heart, because when David would sin, when he would fall, he did it more than once, he would quickly turn back to God. And that's what made him the apple of God's eye, because he would admit when he screwed up. He would admit when he was out of the will of God. Oh, to God that we could be that way in the house of God today and stop justifying what we're doing. And when we know we're living outside of God's will, but somehow we just justify this. Can you take this down a little bit? It's ringing. Oh, that we would be like David and have a heart that says, I'm sorry, God. David, one of his big mess-ups, he lusted after a woman that he seen. He lusted after a woman that he seen. And he told his servant, go get that woman. I want her to be mine. And he took that servant into the, he took that woman into his palace and had his way with her she became pregnant and to try to cover up the sin that he made he brought her husband back home but her husband was such a faithful servant of David David said I want you to go home and be with your wife he said I won't do it we're at war and I won't do it the other soldiers can't be here I'm not going to take it easy either and the, his, he went and slept on front of the palace and David said I told you to go be with your wife he said I'm not I'm I'm not about that right now so David sent the man to the front lines of the battle to be killed to cover up try to cover up his sin 
He sinned and he sinned and he sinned. But there's a wage that comes with sin. There's a payday that comes with sin. And David found out not too long after that. Even though he repented, even though he turned and admitted to God, I'm sorry. There was a payday coming because sin has a wage. And death came into David's house. What is the wage of sin? A death came into David's house and took that baby that was conceived in sin. It wasn't that baby's fault. It was David's fault, David's selfishness. And his sin had a payday. Let us not be confused. There's two paydays coming. I know I'm giving you information that you already know this morning. But here's my real question and my real point to everything I've done today. If we know there's two paydays coming, How many's got a payday in your hand? Just hold it up. Thank you. You can put it back down. You can put them back down. If we know there's two paydays coming, but we're too quick to sin. I don't mean to sound insensitive this morning, but we are awful quick to send everyone that passes away to heaven. I look at the Facebook post. And it doesn't matter how the individual lived. Didn't matter the lifestyle they lived. Didn't matter if they confessed God or not. Didn't matter if the fruit of God being in their life is evident. Didn't matter how they talked, how they treated people. We have a tendency to only recognize one payday. And I know I sound a little old fashioned this morning. I don't care. There's two paydays coming. Not everyone that goes to heaven. Not everyone that even says, Lord, Lord, will enter in. That's the words of Jesus. He says, Jesus said, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into heaven. But he that does the will of the... I want to ask you if you're doing the will of the Father. I'm not trying to scare you into something. I'm not trying to give you a rapture drill and scare you into an altar call. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to present to you the truth gospel message. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter in, but he that does the will of the Father. I want to know, is God's will being done in your life? Is that what you're acting on? Do you know him well enough that you can act on that will? I'm sorry, Pastor. I'm sorry I'm being mean. But I love you too much to watch Christian people flounder. Flounder involved in everything in the world. Putting everything in the world in front of God. It's like, it's, it's, it's like, it's like there's no room in the inn. Like when Jesus was a baby and they're looking for an inn. There's no room in the inn. There's no room in the inn. That's how I feel that we respond to Jesus. There's no room in the end because we haven't built our lives around Jesus. But if there's room for Jesus, we'll let him in. God forbid that be how, be how we live our life. But may our whole life be centered around Jesus. That's where your success comes from. That's where your blessing comes from. That's where your happiness comes from. That's where your payday is coming from. A relationship with Jesus Christ. And if we know that there's two paydays coming, my question is, why are we living that way? My question is, if we know and we really believe that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, why aren't we sharing the gospel more than we're sharing it? Why aren't we pulling our loved ones 
from the grips of the demonic. My God, I'm preaching to myself too. Don't look at me thinking, boy, he's got it all together. I don't. But there has got to be a paradigm shift in the kingdom of God. And we've got to go into all the world and preach the gospel. All of our world. We have to touch all those in our world. And the ones that don't know Jesus, even if it feels uncomfortable, we have to tell them about Jesus. Even if it's, even if it's, let me just say it again, because even if it's uncomfortable, we have to tell them about Jesus. There's a payday coming. There's a payday coming. I don't want anyone to go to hell. What are we going to do to stop it? Hallelujah. I won't do this altar call. You may be in this place this morning. What your payday is going to look like. You may be in this room this morning thinking the foundation that you had once laid for your family isn't what it once was. You may look at it and say it needs fixed for the future generations. You may be in here this morning just holding on by the last thread waiting on God's promise. I have good gospel news for you. Jesus already paid for it. He already paid for the salvation. He already paid for the forgiveness. He already paid for the rebuilding of the foundation. And just hang on, because if God said it, He will perform it. God loves you and he's not mad at you he's been waiting on you I'm going to count to three and if you don't know him and you want to know him I want to I want to invite you to stand up and boldly come to this altar I'm going to count to three and if you need a renewal And if you need a foundation strengthening and rebuilding, I'm going to invite you to come to this altar. If you just need a faith boost in this house, I'm going to count to three and I want you to come to this altar. I want to make mention of this. There's a man in your Bible and his son needed a healing. The Bible says he had a dumb spirit. Couldn't talk. The Bible says that the spirit would throw the boy in the water and throw him in the fire and make him have seizures and convulse. He brought his son to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, do you believe that I can heal the boy? The man looked at Jesus and said, Lord, I believe. But help my unbelief you have no idea how many times that I've had to pray Lord I believe but help my unbelief you have no idea how many times have I had to, I've had to pray God my desires are not right they're not toward you the things of this world are pulling me away from what would I know you where you want me to be God change my desires connection with God I'm going to invite you to come I'm not going to pray over you this is about you and him this is about you and him one two three 